It's time for Windows Weekly. Paul Therod and Mary Jo Foley are here to argue about Windows Threshold, take Office 365 to task for a dismal week of reliability, and maybe, just maybe, the surface is dying. Windows Weekly is next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Windows Weekly is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Windows Weekly with Paul Therott and Mary Jo Foley. Episode 369, recorded July 2nd, 2014. Gozer uses Scribe. This episode of Windows Weekly is brought to you by Personal Capital. With Personal Capital, you'll finally have all your financial life in one place and get a clear view of everything you own. Best of all, it's free. To sign up, go to personalcapital.com slash windows. And by ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter makes hiring faster, easier, and cheaper. Post your job to 50-plus job boards with one click. Try ZipRecruiter for a free four-day trial now at ZipRecruiter.com slash windows. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash windows. It's time for Windows Weekly, the show that covers Microsoft and unlocks the secrets of the software giant. Whether it be for home, for business, or for the enterprise, we're here to decipher the puzzle wrapped in an enigma served on a service Joined, of course, by our fantastic hosts, starting with Miss Mary Jo Foley, author of All About Microsoft Blog on ZDNet. Mary Jo, thank you for uh, for being here. Thanks, Padre. It's nice to have another enterprise guy on the show. I know, I know. Oh, and by the way, I, I, I do have to say that you look absolutely elegant in those uh, yellow earbuds, which we've all come to envy. Because <laughs> I, I think they were limited edition, nice. right? Yep, from uh, Nokia. The old Nokia before Microsoft bought them. Exactly. So you can't get those anymore, folks. That's that's right. If you want cred, <laughs> you need to have the yellow earbuds. Also joining us is the equally brilliant, not not quite as elegant, <laughs> Mr. Paul <laughs> Throt, right. the uh, master of the Windows Supersite, windowsupersite.com. Paul, thank you for coming back for another heaping uh, dose of abuse. <laughs> thank you for being here. You, uh, Leo, you look different today, sound different. Yeah, well, I, you I've appear... heard black is slimming, so <laughs> we're going to try this right. out and see if, uh, how that works. Now, I, I know we've got, a, we've got a fun doc filled with Windows news, but uh, I, I wanted to get your opinion on a little something, something. I, I know you don't like talking about rumors. In fact, Paul, I know that you're dead set about ever bringing up anything that's ever in the rumor mill, but... Interesting. Sources, <laughs> close, trusted sources, close to the, yeah. uh, the truth... Uh, have said that uh, more and more tidbits are floating out about the Microsoft smartwatch. In fact, Tom's hardware may have gotten a sneak peek at what the design looks like. And uh, the interesting thing about it is it may not actually be a watch. Uh, yeah, I, that, I, was, I was just writing something about this. The watch that's not a watch. The watch that's not a yeah. watch. Now, what does that mean, Microsoft Paul? is cagey like a fox. <laughs> <laughs> Now, a, a few of the things that we do think we know about it is it's going to have 11 sensors, so it's going to be like my, uh, Apple's F Forte. It'll give you things from temperature to pulse rate, all, all the all the fun biometric data that you've come to expect from a smartwatch that has not yet been revealed. It's also going to be cross-platform. They think it's going to work on Windows, on Android, and iOS, which I, I like. That's that's a little bit new. Yeah, right. Yeah, playing nice, supposedly. Uh, it's got a slim band design. So think of a Nike fuel band, but make it wider. But here's the thing that that I actually, I really like, Paul. The screen is going to be on the inside. I I mean, I, I have no firsthand knowledge of this. So I'm just going off of the same stuff you've probably seen online. And all I have to say is the most credible part of this is the notion that it will work with all smartphone platforms, right? right? Because if Microsoft were to come out with something that was just for Windows Phone, it would be, an, <laughs> it, be it would just be a non-starter. Yeah, yeah non you know, sorry. And, but so to me, that part of it lends some credibility because that is, I think, how Microsoft will approach wearables. 
Right, right. I, I actually really like this because the, the approach to wearables has been, oh, it's a smartwatch, right? Look at the Pebble, look at Android's Forte. Yeah. I, I not, I'm not really sold on watches. I don't wear a watch. Well, but the reason, is, a lot of the reason, or a big part of the reason, I should say, is that the smartwatches look like a smartphone that's strapped to your wrist. Right. Like they're humongous. Yeah, yeah and there's no way you know, to get rid of that. that. Uh, yeah, Mary, I mean, I wear Mary a Fitbit, Joe. so it needs to be this kind of mm -hmm. size if it's going to be on your wrist. It can't be some ginormous square. Now, uh, Mary Jo, are you planning to strap a smartphone to your wrist? Definitely. <laughs> Especially if it has live tiles. It's I'm all in. <laughs> <laughs> wow, she's all in. I'm well, all in. Well, and that's what I, I kind of, if this approach turns out to be true, and I really hope it is, I, I, I'm not big on this. I think this is this is dated. No one does this anymore unless you really want to draw attention to your, your wrist, right. which maybe some people right. do. But the idea of having the screen on the inside so that you could just sort of peer down at your, your wrist and see what's going on. And if you don't have a ginormous screen so that it feels like you've got a smartphone strapped to your, uh, to your wrist, I, right. I actually kind of like that approach. If, if this turns out to be true, I think that's the right approach for Microsoft to take because then it ends up being different, very different from what the other manufacturers are trying to release. And, you know, they've already done their attempt at a watch a number of years mm -hmm. ago, the spot watch, right? So they, they kind of learned from that, I bet, about what works, what doesn't. And all these new watches that are rolling out, like the Android watches, you just see people saying that is not elegant. It's nothing I would wear. It's too big. It looks like a giant screen on your hand. It's funny and how the it? same they are, right? That's I know, the they're all the watch. same. You know, they're, they're color, right. obviously, and they integrate with phones. We didn't have phones back then, but yeah. I mean, they're, it's the same problem as it was 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and that's that's the thing. I mean, technology has changed, but our wrists haven't. So <laughs> I, I, there's only so much information well, sure. you can pack into that little space. Sure. Sure. Yeah. So until I, you know, I, I, Microsoft has a unique handle on one aspect of uh, social cues that maybe say uh, the folks at Apple and Google don't, which is that what what is it what is okay to do in meetings in a work situation? You know, and um, a lot of places don't want people to bring in computers because. They sit there with their head down in their laptop and they're typing away and God knows if they're actually doing anything related to the meeting. Um, same thing with a phone. You know, if you're sitting there staring into a phone screen, a lot of people think, well, that's not just rude, it's you're not paying attention to the meeting. But I've often kind of joked, you know, what what signals to the crowd of people you're with that you don't care what they're doing more, more than you doing this kind of thing? Right, hmm. right. You know, I mean, it, you're really kind of sending that signal that they're not important to you. And, um, I, you know, I, that's, it's kind of a goofy, jokey kind of a thing. But honestly, I think Microsoft really does have a better handle on that kind of stuff. And, you know, maybe they'll get that aspect of it right. Isn't that you know, isn't the, the universal sign? I mean, when you do this, normally, yeah, yeah. I don't care about what yeah. you're saying. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I want out. <laughs> uh, there, see, exactly. That's what it means. It means yep. uh, I'm, this is unimportant to me. Yeah. I, I have something to do. And, you know, they've been doing things with the fitness band or, you know, around what they've been doing on Xbox, right? And they've been playing up the fitness, being health and fitness. So it kind of is part of the theme of some of the apps and, and messaging that they've had with their other platforms, too. So in a lot of ways, it makes sense. Right, right. And we've got a lot of people in the chat room who are screaming at us saying, but if you put the screen on the inside, it bangs into things. Yeah. But, I mean, that's if, if you... Again, you strap a smartphone to the inside of your wrist. If you make it like the Nike Fuel Band, if you give it a curved sure. screen or even a flexible screen, and you don't try to cram so much information into the display that you're just duplicating what you have on your phone, then you have a unique product. Then you have something that people might actually like. Yeah, uh, actually, you're right. And, and the Fuel Band has a very durable, kind of rugged quality to it that's um, consistent across the entire surface of it. You know, there's no, there is obviously a front to it, but it doesn't matter. You can bang any part of it. It's all built the same way. Right, right. Yeah. And maybe they'll, maybe they'll still have a watch too. Like maybe this is one of multiple wearables that they have. I mean, they have a whole wearables team inside of sure. the operating systems division. So it doesn't mean they're only going to do one type, one type thing that goes on your wrist. I just they may there's have like a place for sure a program where other people can make wearables and... Mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, that nobody does, and we've that, got, I don't know. We've got Chickenhead21 in the chat room who says, well, 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 we bring back some old technology. Just put one of those Swatch Watch rubber bands on top of it. You're good to go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right? That's problem solved. Problem solved. Mm -hmm. All right, let's, let's move away from news that uh, we like to speculate on uh, and talk about news that uh, we like to speculate on. Paul, tell me, what is <laughs> yeah, the threshold? Say, that's a, there's, there's really much difference as we move forward. <laughs> 
Does the Microsoft Windows threshold, uh, th a little bit of news is trickling out about it. Uh, we, we now yeah. know a little bit about how it works and uh, the technology that goes into it, but why should we care? <laughs> <laughs> That's, uh, wow, I, I, I actually wasn't prepared for that question. So <laughs> I, I, was, I was just thinking something along the lines of, you know, this is kind of Mary Jo's story. I mean, and, but I, I, now that you say it like that, I, I guess I will throw in one thing, which is that... Um, I'm always amazed each time a new version of Windows comes around the corner, whether it's Windows 8, Windows 8 1, even, you know, kind of a minor release, or Threshold, and how big of a deal it is. Um, and for all of the talks, you know, Windows is doomed, everyone's using Android and iOS, um, PCs are yesterday, new version of Windows comes out, and the whole world stops and pays attention. And so, you know, the, the why of it, I'm not, a, I'm not a psychiatrist, but I mean, uh, obviously we all, not we all, but most of us rely on Windows to some degree, and I think there's still uh, a lot of interest in the platform, you know, and, and I mean, I know there is for us, obviously, we cover Windows for a living, and, and uh, we know a lot about Microsoft, but I just think in the wider world, it's one of those things that gets discounted, how popular this stuff really is. Mary Jo, Friendly Manitoba in the chat room is saying, we should care because, well, this fixes Windows 8. Does this does this really <laughs> fix Windows 8? Because they said that about Windows 8 1. Oh, this is this fixes the things that people hate about Windows 8. Is is this just that again? Or do, do you actually believe that this is going to address most of the issues that people have with how Windows 8 operates? I do. I think I think Microsoft, you know, they haven't wanted to say that Windows 8 is Vista 2.0, but Windows 8 is Vista 2.0, pretty much. And <laughs> Even if you like Windows 8, even if you found a way to make your peace with Windows 8, you've got it to work the way you want it to work. For most people, the I, I'd say not the people who watch this podcast necessarily, but the er, er, everyday people out in the street, they think Windows 8 is a failure. So Microsoft really needs to come up with something that looks different, works differently, and most of all, convinces Windows 7 users that it's safe to come back into the Windows pool. And they're going to have a different experience with Start, which Paul uh, wrote quite a bit about this week, that I think is going to work a lot better. They're going to have different SKUs that are tailored more to the hardware. So if you have, say, a really small um, tablet or a phone, you're going to have a SKU on there that does not have the desktop we're hearing. And I think that makes sense. It's a very jarring experience for many people still to go between the desktop and the Metro style environment. So they're really tailoring these SKUs to the type of hardware you have. If you have a hybrid two in one tablet, you're going to have a different experience when your keyboard is attached versus when your keyboard is unattached. And I think this is going to be good. It's going to auto detect basically what you're running and have the correct experience show up. I, I also do believe that you'll still be able to change a lot of the defaults too. So if you're someone who does actually love the tiled interface and you don't want to have the mini start menu that they're coming up with, I think you're going to have the option to opt out of that and have have Windows the way you want to have it. Yeah, that's that's what I had heard uh, specifically yeah. was that the that start experience, um, you know, would default in certain ways depending on the type of machine you have, much like the way the computer boots today does. But that if you preferred one or the other, you could switch it however you wanted. So if you had a, an x86 type tablet and wanted the start menu for some reason, that would be fine. But if you wanted that full screen experience on a desktop computer, like you would have today in Windows 8 or Windows 8.1, um, you could do that as well. Yeah. So Mary Jo, we, we've got these three new SKUs. We've got, you know, modern, no desktop. We've got the hybrid, again, as you said, the two and the one. We've got, we've got the desktop version. It, my question to you is, is this, is this, is this a retreat? Is this just an adjustment or are we saying, okay, Microsoft has finally figured out that different users will use Windows different ways according to the devices that they have and they can have one operating system but give it three different looks and feels? Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know if I'd say a retreat. I, and, and even if it is a retreat, I think it doesn't really matter at this point. What they built didn't work for many people who don't have touch laptops or touch tablets. And they still have a very large installed base who are trying to run Windows PCs, Windows laptops, traditional desktops. And for them, they need a different experience because they're very hooked in with their mouse and keyboard. So I think the assumption when they were building Windows 8 three plus years ago was there would be a ton of touch tablets in the market and maybe the traditional devices would be gone by now. 
but they're not gone. And people are still very yeah. wedded to using mouse and keyboards. So I think they've come to the realization, like, we've got to build for what people want. And what and our main customer base is still the enterprise, even though we're trying to go after consumers. And we have to build what these people want. Well, okay. So the, their main customer is the enterprise, but I, will this convince enterprises that they need to migrate to Threshold and not to Windows 7? Because what, what I'm hearing from the people who are still actively doing the administration that I used to do is, yeah, we're not even considering Windows 8. You know, it, every rollout plan we have for the next two right. years is all Windows 7. Will this push that over? Do, do they add the hooks to make it easier to deploy? Do they make the licensing not such a nightmare? Uh, uh, have they addressed that, or is this just interface? So it's it's pretty early in the, in the development cycle of Threshold, and usually the last thing they decide on when they come up with a new operating system is the licensing and the packaging. Um, so I think they haven't decided definitively what are these SKUs going to look like, who's going to get it for free. But I heard a rumor this past week that they are considering letting Windows 7 users get Threshold for free. Hmm. Um, not just Windows 8 users, but Windows 7 users too. And if that does happen, that shows you how serious they are about trying to get people off Windows 7 um, and onto the next latest version of the of Windows. I, I think it's also good to point out the mainstream support for Windows 7 ends January 13th, 2015. So that's another reason. <laughs> yeah. They want to get off Windows 7. Well, I mean, is that just, okay, we're going to repeat the Windows XP end of life mm -hmm. disaster all over again. People are going to say, wait a minute, this yep. is a perfectly good operating system. <laughs> what are you doing? Right. I don't think there's any way to avoid that. And when you were asking about, you know, is this something that will convince businesses not to do what they're already doing? Or what could we do to convince them? And the answer is nothing. They're not going to change the way they do things. Um, businesses don't move quickly into the future of technology, and that's completely understandable. They like things that work. And when they find something that works, they want to just keep using it. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's not going to, that's not, I don't think the goal, I, I, in, in some ways, the goal is to keep people on the Windows platform generally. Um, you know, when they, in, when they thought up Windows 8, it looked like the whole world was moving to tablets and phones. And so they had to make Windows work like a tablet and a phone. And then they got a, a lot of pushback. And then they discovered not everyone is moving. And so maybe the PC user base shrinks a little bit. But it, it's it's kind of a strange thing. That by, by going the popular route, they thought, uh, they ended up alienating a lot of their, you know, their best customers. And so... I mean, I, honestly, I, I, retreat's kind of a tough word, but I think of this more as just a, like a, a mulligan, you know, that they need to do right by those people who intend to stick on the PC platform. And um, I don't think it's so much about attracting uh, businesses off of Windows 7 per se. I mean, they're still on Windows at least, you know. Uh, Paul, are, are we are we in the post post PC era? I mean, again, all the no, and, and that term is dumb. <laughs> the, term, the term is ridiculous, but you know, I, I, yeah. we've heard it tossed at us so many times. Oh, well, look at the numbers. No one's using PCs anymore. Or, or look at the sure. numbers. Everyone's going back to PCs. Mm. It, it seems to me as if we, we've kind of evolved past that that discussion, yeah. right? It's it, there's no yeah. post PC. You're going to have a PC. You're going to have a tablet. You're going to have mobile devices, and it's it's all just about how you decide to consume. Uh, it's yeah. now it's a bit more clear cut in the enterprise, right? Right, Mary Jo? Because in man enterprise, yeah. the PC is not going anywhere. In fact, the PC is no. still it's the de facto standard. If you do not use a PC, you will not work in the enterprise. Pretty much. I mean, not I wouldn't say for every enterprise. There's always some exceptions, but you know, here in New York, you really see, you know, banks, insurance companies, big big installations of Windows, tens of thousands of desktops. And when I say desktops, I mean PCs not tablets. I mean, there are tablets, obviously, coming in into banks, into insurance companies, but the main form factor for many people is still a PC in, in the enterprise. Right, right. Uh, Paul, let me ask you a hypothetical. If if you could be a, a little birdie in the <laughs> year of Nadella and <laughs> right. you could lay out a plan through which Windows would be adopted, Windows 8.1 would be adopted in the enterprise, would be adopted across platforms, what what would it be? What's what's what are they missing the most right now? Is it the skew confusion? Is it the interface inefficiency? Uh, is it the licensing nightmare? Uh, what's right. what's the one thing that they have to fix before we actually start to see adoption of uh, Windows 8.1? Yeah, there's no way to win this one. I mean, uh, um, 
they're not going to change in the way that enterprise does things, right? So Microsoft could give Windows away for free, uh, and and they're still not going to upgrade past Windows Seven. Not today. You know, it's it's still too expensive to do the training and compatibility testing and rewriting of LOB apps and whatever it is. Um, it doesn't. The, the cost of Windows, the you know, the Windows license has nothing to do with the cost, the overall cost of that kind of migration. Um, honestly, it, it's 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 one of those kind of um, it's like a catch twenty two. You know, by making Windows more reliable, by making it run better on lower end PCs and older PCs, by extending the licensing. I'm sorry, the um, uh, the support for uh, Windows out to basically ten years for businesses. They've ensured that businesses will never move quickly to new versions of Windows because now they can stay on these things. You know, they they basically did exactly what businesses wanted, and now they're stuck because what businesses want ultimately is not to move very quickly to the next thing. Um, th this is just a situation that I just I, I don't see it ever changing. Um, Office three sixty five is an interesting test because here we've got enterprise class software in the cloud that is being updated fairly regularly. It's rubbing some people the wrong way, and they're addressing that, and we'll see how that goes. But, you know, Windows as the core platform on which their applications run, um, that's another thing entirely. And I just, I, 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 there is no thing that makes that okay for, the, you know, for, for enterprises. All right. Uh, Mary Jo Foley, we've got people in the chat room who are yelling, oh, look, just just make it free. You know, uh, ex expand on what Paul was talking about, where you, you could have that free update. You could have that free move to the latest, greatest version. But from an enterprise point of view, that that ha is absolutely bunk, right? That doesn't work because the cost isn't the operating system. The cost is the training. The cost is deployment. Right. The cost, cost is rollout. Uh, mm -hmm. You can't fix that, right? Yeah. Well, you can fix it, I think. I think we've seen with what Microsoft's done since Windows 8 with Windows 8.1 and Windows 8.1 update that you can make it easier for people to figure out. You can put more visual cues in there like the power button, the search button, um, a tutorial perhaps showing people how to use things like the charms. And when Microsoft <laughs> first came out with Windows 8, they didn't have any of that, right? Yeah. And so Enterprise freaked out. They were like, oh man, how am I going to do this? I'm going to spend millions in training. And I think all you can do a lot of things, especially with this new mini start menu that they're talking about, to give people visual cues, things that look familiar. Uh, supposedly, with this with this mini start menu, you can opt to either have live tiles. You could have your uh, programs come up in a list, like a, actually a, a um, written list instead of tiles. So you can kind of adjust it for the way that your workers are more comfortable um, inter interacting with the PC, which is a, something they didn't do with Windows 8. And I think they've learned their lesson now that they may need to make this super, super intuitive. Right. Super, super, super intuitive and Microsoft haven't always gone. <laughs> no, that's true. <laughs> oh, so sad. So sad. In fact, they mean? almost never did. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're I've allergic. never heard that. <laughs> <laughs> now, okay, I, I do want to go a little bit on uh, the, the surface. Just, just because uh, one of my co-hosts, uh, uh, Brian Burnett for uh, Know How on Thursdays, he came to me and he said, well, over the weekend, he went into a Microsoft store because they had uh, they started that new campaign where you could trade in a MacBook for uh, and get up to up to six hundred and fifty dollars. Although uh, I, I had an old MacBook Air that I think they wanted to give me like eighty five dollars for. So no, right. not, not so much. But he had a very interesting tale. He, he went in there and he showed them his MacBook. He said, well, how much would you give me for this? And the salesperson takes him aside and he says, look, don't do it. Go sell this on eBay. Go sell this on Craigslist. Right. You'll get a thousand. You'll get eleven hundred dollars, and you can come back and buy a Surface. So even the salespeople are saying, "Yeah, it is no, no, don't do, that. just go away, just go away." It, it, but, but you but, know what? Uh, that makes sense. I mean, I, I think of the a lot of people heard this deal and they said, "Oh, Microsoft's desperate." You know. Um, I look at it a different way. I, I I think this is just something that can be get out there in the public. And it shows people that Microsoft feels like they have a product that stands up well to this thing. That um, even if no one ever takes advantage of this deal, what they're saying is you will want to replace your MacBook Air with this because this thing is better. Um, I don't know that the point was to stockpile a bunch of used MacBook Airs in a warehouse somewhere. I think the point of this was just to be able to tout this. You know, they brought up MacBook Air at the launch event about 117 times. They couldn't stop talking about it. 
um, they are they're fixated on the MacBook Air, and I think this is a way to extend that fixation out to the public eye, um, so that people understand out in the general public that this is what we're focused on. You know, we are trying to beat this thing. Now, going on a few weeks, are you still loving your surfaces? Oh, I switched to a MacBook Air. Oh, um, no. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> and an iPad. Uh, get Mary Joe. Kid. <laughs> Uh, I'm I'm using my Acer. I've I'm done with my Surface Pro three. I just I for me it was just a loner, anyways. That I I wanted to see using it if I was going to actually go and sell my Sur my uh, Acer S seven instead. Wow. And I decided nope. I prefer the traditional PC form factor to so the Surface. Both of you have switched away from. Oh no no I'm I'm kidding I I, I did not switch. Away. Oh, okay okay. So um I <laughs> for me it's a little more complicated. I uh, I only use a laptop when I travel. I I use a laptop a little bit around the house, but when I'm working at home, I, I sit in front of a desktop computer, with keyboard, mouse, etc. Um, if that were my only computer, I don't know that I could use it. 24-7 uh, every day. Um, I'll know a little more when the, I, I'm going to test the docking station when that arrives, um, whenever that is, sometime in August, I think. Um, but I don't know that I could, it could be my only machine. But the thing I like a, a lot about the Surface Pro 3 is how well it travels. It's really thin and light. I throw it in the trout, the bag, you know, the carry-on bag that I use. It kind of disappears in there. It's nothing. Um, but it is a full PC and it's powerful enough. It runs Photoshop very well which I actually need. It runs Visual Studio very well. Uh, obviously, all the Office apps and everything. The screen's big enough. It's not ideal for me. I, I prefer much bigger screens. But, um, you know, for business travel, uh, Mary Jo and I will be going to the uh, partner conference, for example, in uh, this month um, when I go to Barcelona in August. You know, I, I will absolutely bring this machine because it's that kind of correct combination of lightweight and good battery life and P actual PC power, you know, not like not like a little chintzy device, but real PC with all of those capabilities I kind of expect to, uh, to have, uh, you know, the keyboard integration, the mouse, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I intend to keep using it. I mean, I, I, if I had to pick, a, like a, you know, a single machine, I, I'm not sure I would pick Surface Pro 3. Um, but for my use, just for business travel, uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Now, we have someone here in the studio who is uh, relatively invested in the Surface platform. Uh, Alex, RTD, I, I understand you have a bone to pick. Yeah. Uh, you mean, what's my beef? Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, I, okay. I've, 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 got a, I've got a bone to pick with, uh, with these guys. Um, I, so, I was, in, I was in San Francisco on Sunday for various reasons, and uh, I, I'm interested in the Surface Pro 3, obviously. And so, I thought I'd, I'd like to check this out. So, there's a nice Microsoft store downtown there and um so i thought i'd go over there and play with it and see how how i like it and um and i did and it's it's a very nice machine i was surprised how thin it was because it's it's almost as thin as a surface 2 the rt version which is what right. i have and like that was wow and it's still light and stuff and so it was fun um too much money for me right now and uh, i'm still considering it but the pen is awesome i really like the one note click thing because i use one note a lot um but anyway so Considering it, uh, at the in the meantime, I noticed that they had the stylus for the Dell Venue 8, which I've had pre-ordered on Amazon, back-ordered for like months, and they haven't shipped it to me. So I thought, as long as I'm there, I'll buy it. So I bought something. So I was on the checkout line, and we were getting the thing going. And uh, and the guy uh, was, um, after, after we did the thing, he was like, oh, you, you, want, a, you want a little football? Because they had this little Microsoft squishy football thing <laughs> at the, uh, the counter. I said, okay, sure. And then I, then I remember that my pal Brian... Uh, who who uh, Padres was just talking about? Who pictured right here? Um, he um, he was just at the Microsoft store. <laughs> That's how he looks like every day, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he, yeah. he was just at the Corte Madera Microsoft store checking out the service, as as we just heard. And and he texted me a picture that of um, some blue Surface sunglasses that they that they gave to him just as a little freebie. And I thought, hey, I'd like some of those. So I asked I asked the guy, do you have any of those sunglasses left? And and he went hmm, and went to touch his little mic thing. Went, hey Joe, do we do we got any of those sunglasses left? And he got his response, and uh, no, they were out of the sunglasses. And you know that that's it. I'm I'm done. Microsoft, screwed, <laughs> I, they've screwed me for the last time, and nice. I I just <laughs> I, I'm, 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 I'm done with them. I'm just I'm just the Liz. You know, I'm so just, done with them right now. I'm just done. Caller, so caller, what's your question? <laughs> so there, um, there's there's my there's my phone. I do have one comment for you, by the way, and I'm not actually sure how you would look this up, but the Dell Venue 8 Pro Pen or whatever that you got. 
Um, you know that's been upgraded at least once, right? So right. I think hopefully he, you got he the... said it was two times. So this is, I think I think I have the okay. latest one. Okay, good. Because I, 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 I don't know what your experience with it has been, but I have not. I don't think it's very good personally. No, I, I, try, I, I wanted just to play with it and see, and so yeah. I, I have it now, and it's yeah, it's, it's all right. It's not as good as okay. the Surface. Did you buy, I mean, the first did you version buy a terrible. Surface Pro 3? No, no. no. Um, I, I, I'm, I want one. He was going to, but then they didn't give him the free sunglasses. Right, yeah, and then no, that was The funny it. thing is, when that guy, got, you know, when he made the call back, out back, he said, you know, do we have any more sunglasses? And the guy back said, yeah, we have like three crates of them. And then he said, yeah, we don't have any. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's I how Microsoft that handles its SKUs, right? I mean, that's yeah, that's, yeah. that's typical. Well, they're, they're, they're saving a beautiful blonde woman? No, no, we're out of those. They're saving it all for this guy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's it's the mustache. Woman. It's the mustache. <laughs> Sorry, Alex. Yeah. Well, the Mac is calling to you, Alex. I know. Now, Mary Jo, when uh, when we come back, I'm thinking maybe we should uh, grant Alex some relief because uh, I just read an article from you talking about how maybe the surface might be no more. I'm just going to leave him on that well. teaser as we take a break to talk about the first sponsor of Windows Weekly. Now, I want to share a tool with you. I know you've, you've heard Leo talk about this company before, but uh, this is the first time that I've been able to, to read their ad. And I got to tell you, I'd, I'm, I'm happy to because it's something that people need, something that in this world today people are looking forward to, and that is personal capital. Now, what is personal capital? Personal capital is a way for you to bring all of your accounts, all your assets, all of your financial resources into one single screen. That's what they do on your computer, on your phone, or your tablet with real-time and intuitive graphs. It's, it's one of these services that allows you to get a grasp on everything that's going on in your financial life and put it on, as we call in the enterprise, a single pane of glass. There is no better way to represent your financial life than all in one place. Now, personal capital solves two barriers to growing your wealth. The first is that it's hard to keep track of your stocks, your 401k, your bank accounts, all on different sites with different usernames and passwords. And the second is that you pay someone to manage it. Well, folks, in, in this day and age, why should you do that? With services like personal capital, with the technology that surrounds us that we talk about each and every single day, there's no reason why you can't be the master of your own financial destiny. And that's what personal capital lets you do. It shows you how much you're overpaying in fees, how to reduce those fees, and you get tailored advice on optimizing your investment. So why wait? No, seriously, why wait? If you've got finances, if you worry about your checking account, your credit accounts, if, if you've got stocks, if you've got investments, you need personal capital. Signing up takes just a minute, and it will pay big dividends. Personal Capital gives you total clarity and transparency to make better investment decisions right away. So here's what, here's what we want you to do. We want you to try Personal Capital. Set up your free account by going to personalcapital.com slash windows. Personal Capital is free and the smart way to grow your money. You must go to personalcapital.com slash windows if you want to thank Windows Weekly for introducing you to the solution for your financial chaos. That's personalcapital.com slash windows. Personalcapital.com slash windows. And we thank Personal Capital for their support of Windows Weekly. Now, Mary Jo Foley, you, uh, you wrote, uh, I'm only, almost going to call this link bait. Uh, that, uh, that maybe wow. the Surface yeah. might be going away. Uh, is Microsoft dumping the Surface, the branding? Are they getting rid of it? Is, is it now dead and gone? No, no, no. And you're forgetting a key word, Padre, branding, oh, Surface branding, okay. not the Surface. Yeah, so um, there's a well-known leaker called Ev Leaks on Twitter who has pretty good tips on mobility and Nokia and Microsoft Mobile in the past. He had a tip uh, over the weekend where he said, it looks like Microsoft may be moving towards rebranding the Surface tablets as Lumia devices. So this is one source. Uh, I, I don't know how many sources Evleaks has, but one source. So we shouldn't jump to conclusions that this has happened. He said it's in the in the final negotiation stages, I believe. And he also said that Microsoft's negotiating with Nokia to try to keep the Nokia brand longer than than it originally had licensed. So it it was actually going to be December thirty first, twenty fifteen, that Microsoft was going to have to give up using the Nokia brand on some of um, some of the phones that it acquired when it bought Nokia. 
Uh, but he says, Evleek says that this is in negotiations also and that Microsoft may be able to pay Nokia some undisclosed amount and actually keep the Nokia brand longer. If not, I, I don't even know if it's indefinitely or not, but much longer than previously expected. So, you know, this got everybody in an uproar because a lot of people think Surface is a really good brand. Um, that Microsoft's invested, obviously has invested a ton of money, especially if you've been watching World Cup soccer, which I know Paul Therott has been very closely. He's been all over that. Um, and yeah. So <laughs> uh, if, if you've been watching, you notice Microsoft has been the lead sponsor, I think, on ESPN for with the Surface branding. And so the question is, are they willing to dump all this investment that they made in the Surface branding to date to try to bring together the Lumia brand for phones, tablets, and and maybe other kinds of devices going forward, like maybe the watch. I don't know. Uh, right. So, yeah, it's it's a rumor at this point, but some people think it would be a positive thing, and I'd say more of my followers and people I've talked to think it's a negative. Well, I mean, it, it does make sense it, it, in, a goal, <laughs> in a goal sense, but um, <laughs> RTD is uh, having a little bit of fun. I love that. But... Um, <laughs> When you look at By it, the you, way, there, there was more soccer action in that scene than there has been in an oh, entire game. Oh, Paul, of the Paul, you just have to get oh, into you're it. Such a hater. You have to get into it's, it. Do they have to mow the lawn before the game ends? Is it that slow moving, or is that just my perception? Oh. Don't you like baseball? Windows Weekly like has baseball. just lost its international audience. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I actually am not much of a sports fan, but I am a huge World Cup fan. I yes. Say. Wow. Yes. And, and, That's and pandering. Look, Paul, That's pandering. There is no better event to sit and drink beer than the World Cup. Exactly. See, I, I knows. <laughs> find many, many reasons why I could be doing that, but <laughs> you don't. You don't have to have a football <laughs> game on. Is just drink the beer <laughs> At, or baseball. <laughs> or now baseball. we're bringing we're bringing out all the sports. The TriCaster is leaking. Uh, this is how it works. <laughs> now, but, but Mary, Mary Joe. So one of the issues that Microsoft is going to have, of course, is that they have they now have two very valuable brands that both deal in the mobile space. You've got Surface and you've got Lumia. And I think that's what your article is touching on, which is, yeah. well, which one yeah. do you save? But my question or is... Or does it have to be one? Right? Yeah, exactly. Right. Why does there have to be one? Uh, Paul, yeah, exactly. why, why, can, why can't there be Lumia, uh, Lumia and Surface at the same time? Yep. No, that, that was the point I made. I mean, why not keep both? I, Daniel uh, Rubino on, on Twitter, when we were kind of hashing this back and forth the other day, said, you know, why not use Surface for the kind of Pro slash x86 products and, um, you know, Lumia for the device slash ARM products or whatever. And, you know, that's one way to do it. Uh, there's all kinds of different ways. But, um, yeah, why can't we have both? Yeah, Because yeah. Mary Jo Foley at this point, uh, we they've spent billions of dollars to develop each brand. Right. Yes. What, what, mess, what sense does it make to discard even one of them? Yeah, you know, I think the, the thinking or the reasoning around this is since Microsoft's trying to do this whole one Microsoft thing and pre present a cohesive whole, that if you have a brand for Surface and a brand for Lumia and you obviously all already have a tablet that is called Lumia 2520, which is from Nokia, and it's right. not called Surface, right? Yeah, like, how do you how do you bring these things together in a way that's less confusing and promotes a single message and a single brand? I I really like the idea Paul and, and Daniel Rubino were talking about, which is rebrand things that are based on ARM as Lumia, because right now yeah. it's it's very confusing to people still when you say um, Windows RT, like what is that? And uh, you know, is is a tablet based on ARM? the same as a tablet based on Intel. No, you can have a desktop on Intel, you can't on ARM, right? Um, so I don't know, that that kind of makes more sense in a way, but that isn't what the tip said. The tip said they're negotiating, making Lumia the replacement brand for Surface. That's what the original tip said. That's just, I mean, it just strikes me so strange. I, after, By the way, yeah. Yeah. mark my words, if this wristwatch fitness band thing comes out and it's called Windows something, I give up. I give <laughs> no. up. No, it will be called. It'll be <laughs> called I, Windows. I give up. Windows Bit for wrist. Call, yeah, no, it'll be like 8. Windows 4. FT for fitness. <laughs> no, I quit. That's when I give up. No, you are insane enough. But but there's also going to be a pro version of the fitness band that actually right. takes yes. up both wrists. Yes. Yes. With Please, Service dear God, let there be a pro the version. Shackles. Yeah. It, it'll ha it'll have perimeter venting. Exactly. Yes. See. <laughs> nice. Can't even hear the fans. You'll be equally warm over all of your wrists. It won't be focused only in one area. 
<laughs> uh, windows space <laughs> please, Yes, please let there be perimeter venting. <laughs> <laughs> Oh R2 God. version. Yeah. Oh. You see how cynical? It's so easy to be like this when you've covered Microsoft yeah. for so long. It's, it's too easy to be it, cynical because you've seen them. It's, it's like a slow motion dive off a I know cliff. it bothers some people, but you have to understand, you know, we've been dealing with this insanity for 20 years plus, you know, for a long time. It's hard. <laughs> I mean, you know, we worry about it. You know, uh, it, it's not impossible to think that they might come up with something ridiculous and call it something really stupid. Okay, Steve, so, Stephen Sandoff on Twitter says they should call it Ristos, W-R-I-S-T-O-W-S. <laughs> Don't give Ristos. them any ideas, guys. I That's know, all they, might take them. they might take Microsoft them. Microsoft Ristos, <laughs> free in your box of Cracker Jacks. But remember that the opposite of love isn't hate. The opposite of love is indifference. So the fact yes. that, that we're, quote unquote, hating no, on exact, Microsoft shows exactly we still right. care. I know. Yeah, we're very passionate about love. it, but we're also tough realistic. <laughs> Yeah, and until I start seeing some brilliant strategic moves from Microsoft, uh, I'm, I'm going to assume that it, they're just continuing the march. The I, I've march. just been hitting the face a lot. Excuse me if I flinch sometimes. I, I you know, <laughs> it, it, it's it's just kind of a natural reaction. Right. I mean, I'm still all Microsoft. All my, I don't even use a MacBook. I use nothing but Microsoft laptops. Well, and a couple of Linux ones. You are truly, truly a holy man. There we go. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> also, I'm used to people looking at me going, uh, what's wrong with you? <laughs> yes. Right. I, yeah. We're used we, to we, that, too. Probably. We all get that, right. too. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Mary Jo, uh, Windows 8X updates. Uh, you've got um, uh, Microsoft issuing an update for Windows 8 RT users. What's that all about? Yeah. So this is this was kind of an interesting under the radar update this week. So remember when Microsoft came out with Windows 8.1? Uh, the way you would get that if you were a Windows 8 user was you were, had to go to th through the Windows Store if you were a consumer to get the update. So you had to know how to go to the store, where to get it, how to download it. And to us, again, on this, on this, twi on this Twit podcast, we think that was really easy. I can tell you from all the mail I got, this was not easy for a lot of people. I had so many people emailing me who could not find it in the store, who couldn't figure out how to download it, who couldn't figure out how to install it. And so Microsoft this week uh, released an update. It's They're calling it a pilot update, where if you are a Windows RT user who's on version 8, it's going to let you use Windows Update uh, and automatic updates to actually move to Windows RT 8.1 instead of having to go through the store. I think this is great because it's a much easier way to get people to upgrade. It's kind of part of Microsoft's whole, we need to get everybody on the latest version so that when Threshold comes out, everybody will be on the latest version and it'll be easier to move them over to the newest update. And I asked Microsoft if they were gonna also release a similar pilot for people who are on Intel versions of Windows 8, who wanna move to Windows 8.1 and not use the store, and they said yes. So expect something similar if you're a Windows 8 user who still, for whatever your reasons are, have not been able or willing to move up to 8.1. This is going to be something out there to help it, you it's, move. It's amazing what a disaster this store that was a disaster. installer was. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It's, I know. And unique in the history of Windows. You know, um, yeah. here is the first version ever, which we will you know, install through this bizarre fashion. Yeah. Um, using an app that you all hate. Um, <laughs> you can't tell whether what it's doing. Uh, good luck. You know, it's just yeah. a really terrible, terrible thing. Yeah. Uh, we uh, I, I we did. Well, I had to do a step by step a video for uh, some of our installations <laughs> overseas. Yeah. At, yeah. Yep. On updating the installed yeah. base of Windows 8 to Windows 8.1, and yeah. it was amazing because I, you know, I had to do the okay. Well, first you need to go into Windows Update. You need to make sure that all of these yeah. updates are installed. Then you go into the Windows Store to get Windows 8.1, and I got an email back saying. Oh Are you God. screwing with us? <laughs> right. Yep. Well, why, right. I know. No, it's, it sounds crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, yep. Well, actually, that's the from the well, even the, even this part of it. You know, um, just launch the store app, and you will see an advertisement for this upgrade. Okay. Yeah, I don't see it now. What? <laughs> you know, like like it, it. The whole thing was so dumb. You know, it was just yeah. dumb. And I, I, they're never going to do it again. So that I guess yeah. that's the good news. Let's hope. Yeah. Let's hope. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, they'll do update three that way, but not update two. And, you know, I, yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Oh, Mary Jo, the pilot that I want to see is I want to see them uh, release an update uh, for just regular Windows 8.1 desktop where I can 
keep the download someplace and not have to redo it every single time for every <laughs> yeah. device across the enterprise. Is, is, yep. Have you heard of a pilot for that in the making? <sighs> I have not, but that would be an excellent idea. Because, you know, what I'd like, <laughs> I like it when my uh, when my 1,000-seat network <laughs> needs to download a, a couple of yeah, petabytes. Yeah, that's always awesome. Yeah, that's yeah. always a good thing. Even better if you've got, like, a branch office and they can do it over, like, a, like a WAN <laughs> link. That'd be great. an ISDN. So, uh, yeah. yeah, that should be no problem. The store is yeah. nice I mean, because it completely, uh, you know, ruins any you know, branch caching type <laughs> stuff that you may have in place. So it's just. Yeah. Just and also, they, yeah. I mean, Microsoft makes a lot of really great deployment tools. Right. And so it's kind yes. of like, why aren't we using these? Right. This is what we want to use. We're used to this. Why can't we do this? Well, I mean, that's what I think that's what baffled all the enterprise people, which is. The, the reason why I stuck with Microsoft all those years when everyone was saying, oh, well, migrate over to OS X or, or here's a right. Linux flavor was the deployment was so easy with Windows. Updating well, was so way, easy with Windows and then it went away. I, I suspect I know why they did it that way because um, on the Mac, they've moved all of their updates into the store app, right? So um, a, a lot of what Microsoft was doing for a long time. I'm not sure if this is the case anymore, but you know, for, for several years there was kind of born out of Apple envy. And I'm sure that this was an attempt to be, you know, well, Apple does this. So, yeah. you know, we'll do it this way. Cause that's what, you know, what people expect. Well, I almost feel that it's the same way with the branding. Well, Apple has one really valuable brand. So that's what we should be doing. It's like, wait a minute. No, 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 no. You, you've constantly said that you have to take care of your partners. And so you, you're never going to be an Apple. You're never going to have that monolithic right, control right. over everything. Yeah. So stop <laughs> you care about your trying partners, to you do can't it. An Apple, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. oh well. <laughs> Just shake our head, and move on. Shake you know? Head. I know. You know, yeah. what, well, we it's not like it's been a year and they they're still trying to get it right. I know, <laughs> right? Something. No, it's it's perfect. Yeah. Perfect. We're just we're so, just tweaking. We're just tweaking a few of the uh, the the decorations. No. We'll get it. Yeah. Now let's get some good news. Uh, good news would be that the Lumia is coming to T-Mobile. Paul. You, you wrote a little bit, a little something, something about the 635. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I, the, Mary Jo has this phone, I believe. I haven't got one for a review. Yeah. It, I, I will. Um, it, it's, it's actually a low-end device, and it's the replacement for the 521, which was T-Mobile's version of the 520, which is one of the, if not the, single best-selling Windows Phone 8 handset that's ever been made. And this is the device that was a $99, no-contract, uh, low-end kind of a phone. And uh, low end in the Windows Phone context means 512 megs of RAM. Um, back then, it would have been a dual core. Well, a single, maybe a single core. I don't remember dual core processor. This one's a dual core. Um, so this is an upgrade for that. And so it's it's a it's a slightly bigger screen. It's still only 512 megs of RAM, which is really unfortunate. Uh, eight gigs of internal storage, uh, but expandable with micro SD. It's got a low end camera. It's just a five megapixel camera, so nothing special there. Um, but it's got some unique little bits to it. It, it is the first Windows Phone 8.1 native phone to be sold in the United States, and that will be happening as soon as next week, I believe. Um, it's fairly inexpensive, and that's neat. It has the sensor core technology that Nokia developed, which allows uh, fitness apps to take advantage of uh, what I'll call, they're not really fitness sensors, but essentially sensors that work together to facilitate fitness applications. Uh, without killing the battery. So if you want to do something like monitor your movement, your steps, the miles you've walked, and that kind of thing, uh, calories that you've burned, it can do that without constantly hitting the CPU and destroying the CPU. And so that's, you know, built in in hardware, and that's great. Um, but it's, you know, it is a low-end device. It doesn't have a hardware camera button, which is really bizarre. Um, uh, it's not a requirement of the Windows Phone spec anymore. It used to be, but I, this, to my knowledge, is the first Windows Phone handset that doesn't have a hardware camera button. And I think that's, you know, one of the neat things about Windows Phone, that kind of pocket-to-picture feature. Um, you can get it in multiple color shells and all that kind of stuff, and that's cool. And I think it will be nice for the f fashion conscious. But, you know, they could have just done a few little upgrades that would have put this thing over the top. You know, a, a gig of RAM, the camera button, um, a slightly higher risk screen. It has a very low risk screen. Um, it's got the software buttons instead of the hardware buttons on the front, that kind of thing. But um, so it's kind of, it's like, a, I don't mean to say it's bad news. It's kind of good news, bad news. It, it's neat that it's coming to the U.S. It's neat that it's low price. Uh, it's neat that we're finally getting a, an 81 native phone. But it's, you know, it's not exactly a flagship phone either. So uh, kind of targeting the low end of the market there. Paul, Mary Jo, do either of you use uh, T-Mobile? No. No? Not if I don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> 
See, no, I, you I, know what though? I, I, so T-Mobile got was in the news today because of an FTC investigation, yeah, or I should say an FTC uh, lawsuit, which is bad timing. But uh, the truth is, or I should say, aside from that. Um, T-Mobile is doing a lot to help change the landscape of the wireless carrier world in very good ways. Um, they call themselves the uncarrier or whatever, but that's just marketing. But, you know, they are now the company where uh, if you want to travel with your phone internationally, you can essentially get free data, phone and text. Uh, it's not super high speed data, but it is free. And then you pay a little bit extra if you want the, you know, the 4G type stuff. Um, they have much better plans than AT&T and Verizon and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, they're T-Mobile. They're, they're the distant third. They're... Um, you know, they're not one of the big boys, so they have to compete a little harder for that stuff. So I, I sort of, I, I support that. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm behind all that. Um, but they've never had a truly great Windows phone, and this certainly doesn't change that equation. And I think that's part of the problem because today, well, I would say until a couple of months ago, if you wanted a really high-end, beautiful Windows phone, it was pretty much AT&T. 920, 1020, 1520. Those are all AT&T phones. Um, Verizon got the Icon recently, and I would say that's the first time a non-AT&T carrier in the United States got a, a truly high-end, wonderful, uh, you know, hero-type phone from uh, for, for Windows Phone. And I, so that's the we problem. We deserved it. We deserved it. We long <laughs> suffered. You waited Verizon long enough. Users. Yeah. Yeah, we did. Well, you don't. I only begrudge you, don't you need, a little bit that you don't need a beautiful mm -hmm. smartphone for a high-end smartphone for T-Mobile because I mean T-Mobile's biggest draw has been the fact that it's relatively inexpensive in fact it's re relatively criminally inexpensive uh yeah. I, i've been using a plan that gets me uh what was it five gigabytes of data it's uh it's only 100 minutes of talk but i never talk on my phone and i pay 30 dollars a month right. I, i've How got one, 30 uh, 30 30, 30 flat. Wow. that's no, it that's, that's amazing yeah and you know i think that's one of the things that has made t-mobile grow so quickly i've got that in my galaxy s4 i'm fine i mean i don't have the smartphone race. In fact, I didn't, didn't even buy this phone from T-Mobile. It was an international version. Yeah. But, I mean, this this is not a super high-end phone, but even though it's, it might be enough for the people who are interested in T-Mobile, if they could get this for $99 yeah. on contract. Uh, right. And actually, uh, you know, there's a deal. Uh, I'm just doing this off the top of my head, but I believe that you can pay $7 a month for the phone for two years. And one of the things that T-Mobile does that AT&T and Verizon still don't do is... Once you've paid for the phone, you're done paying. So, right. you know, you know that when you're in a contract with AT&T, for example, uh, you buy a subsidized phone, it, it, the cost of that is factored into your wireless bill. But if you were to pay that off you know, after two years, typically, if you don't upgrade your phone, you know, you're still paying for that phone that you've already paid off. Like they don't have that sort of a system, uh, at least not in their standard contracts. Obviously, they have pay-as-you-go type deals. But, you know, that's one of the things T-Mobile does. They allow you to pay for a phone until it's actually paid off. Um, so $7 a month for two years is not a lot of money, but it's also not a lot of money per month, which is another way for people to get into what is, you know, a decent smartphone. I'm not trying to, I, I don't mean to undercut it. It's just that it's not a, you know, it's not a, it's not a, Super an amazing high phone. Right. Yeah. It's not cutting edge. You won't be showing it to anyone saying, I bet you don't have this. Well, it's colorful. You could get the orange one. They probably don't have an orange one. <laughs> but, but the question, Mary Jo Foley, will it come? With yellow earbuds. That's a no. <laughs> no. <laughs> those, are, those are gone. No, sadly, no. Sadly, no. Now, I, I have to say, I, I've loved T-Mobile. Uh, I've, yep. I've been using them for three, four years now. Uh, wow. But I am so saddened by the fact that they are the fastest growing carrier right now because it used to be that I was alone. I was the only one using T-Mobile wherever <laughs> I was, and my speeds nice. were ridiculously yeah. fast, uh, especially right. here in San Francisco. I, you know, in D.C., I was I was actually getting about 45 megabits per second down. I think now I'm, I'm lucky if I, I get three. Yeah, same phone. Oh, well. Let's move on. I don't, you know, I don't, I, I don't know about Mary Jo. I, I, I arguably don't have a normal experience with any of this stuff, and it, it kind of it, it skews my perceptions of things. I mean, I have to travel before I can understand what things are like in the real world. Because, you know, I work from home and I, I leave the house, obviously, but I only, I go out to get the mail or, you know, sometimes I, <laughs> you know, pick up my kid at school or something, but I, I ferret myself back into the house as quickly as possible. So, I, you know, I, I in my experience, you know, AT&T has been good around the country and I know Verizon would be as well. I'd be a little concerned about T-Mobile, although obviously I'm sure that's getting better. But the truth is, you know, even at lower speeds and so forth, I'm not really sure my experience would be all that horrible because I, the heavy hitting stuff I would do at home on Wi-Fi anyway. You know, if I was going to listen to an audio, audible book, 
I would download that couple of hundred megs at home on Wi-Fi, and then I would leave the house and listen to it out. You know, I wouldn't download it over the 4G connection or whatever, you know? So, I mean, I'm, I'm, it might not even matter anymore. We might be getting to a point where uh, even if you're getting lower speeds on something like that, it, it, it may not be a big deal for most people. Oh, it matters. It matters. It doesn't I mean, matter. I've, okay. saved, I've saved $70 to $80 a month by using this uh, T-Mobile plan. and that Oh, it matters in the other 70 way, yes. 80 has yep. gone straight into tacos, which have destroyed my body. Yep. So, yep. I mean, <laughs> it all depends on yeah, how here, you look Here what matters more, I think, is where you have coverage because – in New York, yeah. you know, there's a lot of kind of subterranean places you may try to, like, take a beer picture on your phone, you know, <laughs> if, if you're me. One and might, theoretically. One might. and might want to upload it to their OneDrive. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there, there's definitely, I've tried with AT&T phones and Verizon phones here, and I definitely can see a difference in coverage on Verizon. I, there's a lot fewer dead zones here with Verizon still. Yeah, I mean, that's, and that's the other thing. It, it really depends on where you live. Um, I yeah. noticed in New York, I could be in a cab going between buildings talking on the phone and my phone will drop calls. Yeah. Uh, whereas my phone doesn't drop calls normally anywhere. Um, this past weekend, we drove um, up to New Hampshire to drop my uh, daughter off at camp and no one had a connect. With this place, it, it, it was the end of the world, apparently. There was no cell phone connection for anybody. Everyone had that. You don't have one bar, you have nothing. <laughs> you know, there's yeah. no connectivity. Um, so those places obviously still exist. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's just going to depend on. Yeah. It's hard to test, I guess. I don't know how you it's would. It's impossible to test. It really it is. is. Yeah. The only way yeah. to do it is to get a phone from a particular carrier and then drive to everywhere you may go. <laughs> yes, yes. To test. That's it. Those maps I need this for six months so I can go on every flight I have to take for work and <laughs> we'll see how it. <laughs> if this works out, I'll stick with it. You know? Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh! Now, 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 for those people who do decide to get this phone on T-Mobile, Paul, you've you've got some some good news for them, right? I mean, we've all been looking for folders, <laughs> and finally, they might be coming. Yeah, I, it's funny. I um, uh, <laughs> folders is one of the features I I had heard was going to be in Windows Phone 8.1 back, you know, a long time ago, and it obviously is not. And when when a page appeared on the Microsoft website that said it would be, you know, and in what they call the Windows Phone 8.1 update, I thought, well, yeah, that was the plan. You know, maybe it will be coming in the future. But a number of people pointed out to me that uh, that's how Microsoft refers to Update 1 now, which is so annoying. Um, mm -hmm. And so obviously, like Windows 8.1, Windows Phone 8.1 will have an Update 1, or what we used to call a GDR1. And the presumption is that this folders feature is going to be coming in that update. And so if, if you've ever used iOS, a modern version of iOS or a modern version of Android, you know that you can... You know, tap and hold on, a, on a, an icon on the home screen and drag it over to another one and you drop it on there and a folder is created. You can add items to it and so forth. And based on Microsoft's description, which has since been pulled down, the Windows Phone version will work exactly the same way, like literally exactly the same way. Um, how you get things in and out, exactly the same. So, yeah, you know, we, it only took um, <laughs> four and a half years. We're going to get folders. So there you go. And in another four and a half years, uh, we may get, uh, oh, I don't know, a higher end start bar. <laughs> it's incremental. It's incremental, Paul. This is how this works. Yeah, yeah sure. Right. Iterative. Iterative. <laughs> Iterative. 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 <laughs> uh, we're going to take a break, but when I when I come when we come back, uh, would the two of you be up to uh, to talking a little bit about some um, embarrassing downage that uh, Outlook has had <laughs> the past uh, week or so? <laughs> Uh, sure. it, it actually goes hand in hand with the announcement of a major mun municipality which has taken Office 365 over on-premise exchange. Does that sound like something we can we can maybe sink our teeth into? I think we could do that. All right, let's let's do that. But first, let's take a break to talk about the second sponsor of this episode of Windows Weekly. Now, if you run a business, if you've ever tried to hire talent for that business to to develop your your base of human resources, you know how difficult it can be to hire. Hiring is not easy in this day and age, especially if you try to go it alone. Uh, I remember I was I was trying to get some talent for a startup that I was helping with down in San Diego, and there was posting to Craigslist and LinkedIn, and we had to hit all the different social media sites. We reached out by mouth, uh, word of mouth. And it was just, it was an absolute pain. Well, if you want to get past that pain, if you want a single place that you can trust to get your message out to the world of potential hires, well, look no further than ZipRecruiter.
Uh, ZipRecruiter is the place to go when you post a job. If you need talent, if you need them right away, and if you want to pull from as large a base as possible, ZipRecruiter is the solution for you. They've got, with so many job boards, with so many different places that produce the, the, the talent that you're looking for, you need a solution that will reach out to them in the places that they are. If you want that position filled fast with the perfect candidate, you need to post your job on all the top job sites. Well, now you can with ZipRecruiter. You post a 50-plus job sites all at once with a single click. They also post your job on social networks like LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, and Google. ZipRecruiter will add your company logo and colors to make your job pages an extension of your business. This is not just a generic posting with, please apply here. No, no, no. This includes your branding, that branding that you've built up over the years that's so important to you. That will be right front and center when you use ZipRecruiter. Now, you can add unlimited users to your account. You can create an instant job page on your website. And you can include a company's career page to use as a careers link. Post once and watch the qualified candidates roll in. ZipRecruiter is easy to use, and their interface makes it simple so that even someone who has a faint understanding of how the technology works can get the right posting, the right candidate, and the right job right away. ZipRecruiter.com will automatically highlight the best candidates for you so that you can choose the one that fits your position. You screen them, you rate them, then you hire the right person fast. So here's what we want you to do. If you're trying to recruit, if you're trying to gather the human resources to make the next giant in whatever industry you decide to take on, try ZipRecruiter and find out why they've been used by over 100,000 businesses. Right now, our listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free for four days by going to ZipRecruiter.com slash windows. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash windows. And we thank ZipRecruiter for their support of Windows Weekly. Now, Paul. This has yeah. not, not been a good day, <laughs> a good week for, for Microsoft Online. I have. What do you mean? It's always a good week for Microsoft <laughs> Online. <laughs> By the way, I saw your note about the one, note, uh, one drive thing, and I, I did add. Oh, fantastic. That Thank you. For you. Um, yeah, uh, there's, there's been some downtime, I heard. Yeah. Also, there's been some downtime. I guess we'll get to that other stuff later. Do we have the. I guess Microsoft, all, I guess it's not in the notes, but Microsoft also caused some downtime for some people with certain domains uh, this week as well, which is hilarious. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's sort of been, the, the so, kids just keep on happening with Microsoft <laughs> Online recently, which yeah, is strange. It's like because they don't get this internet thing. They, they made such a big push at TechEd for Azure. I mean, they were telling everyone, sure. okay, this is the year of Azure. This is the year of Azure. And uh, three days later, they had to make the announcement, yeah, we're starting to run out of IPv4 addresses for Azure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know, but Azure never went down. Oh no, no, nope. no, of course not. <laughs> so, it can't. You know, it can't. It's technically for us. impossible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah, but the link online and the Exchange online outages last week they they were pretty bad. Um, yeah. And yeah. Microsoft at the end of the week issued a partial explanation of what happened. They said the two outages, which were back to back, by the way, were unrelated to each other. They <laughs> oh, said, well, good. That's, that's good, good to know. Uh, yeah, because well, because okay. some of us were wondering, was the third day going to be SharePoint Online goes down since they already had Link Online and Exchange Online. But luckily, that did not happen. And we're not trying to jinx that. But they said, um, I'm looking here. They said Exchange Online, it was, the trigger was an intermittent failure in a directory role that caused a directory partition to stop responding to authentication requests. And then it kind of spiraled from there. <laughs> And uh, on Link, they said that uh, it was an inability to connect to, quote, external network failures. <laughs> um, so, yeah. I, uh, anyway, they, they've said that they're going to take into consideration um, the SLAs, the service level agreements that people have in place. And if you did not meet the bar, if they did not meet the bar in any case, they will compensate you directly. Or the downtime. Well, of course, it, it didn't meet the bar. I mean, if you were on the East Coast, you your your entire Tuesday was wiped out. Your productivity was gone because you yeah. couldn't. Although access not everybody, anything. not everybody though, which was interesting. Like I I was getting some of my email, but not all of it, which was kind of interesting. Like some would trickle in, and it, sometimes it would take an hour. Um, some never showed up at all. So I think it's going to be difficult to figure out who was well, actually. Uh, but it, but if you were a customer who was impacted in that way. Yeah. They have a 99.99% uptime guarantee that's 
on a financially backed SLA. So you should be getting a credit on your next bill toward that amount of downtime, I guess. Wait, Mary Jo, are, are you saying that you actually had emails that haven't showed up at all? They didn't get queued up. They didn't get delayed. They just are gone. I believe at least a couple that I knew of. Okay, so that scares me. That really scares me because I yeah. the assumption has always been, yeah, you may not be able to access it, but it will all right. be there when they finally fix whatever widget right. isn't working properly. It's if taking they, that zero right. inbox thing a little too seriously. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> if they're actually losing data during these outages, that's right. that's another level of... And of storm. And, and you know, it, it, what's hard to prove in this case was people, I had so many people sending me emails that day saying, do you know that exchange is down? So of course I wasn't getting those because exchange <laughs> is down. Yeah. It's working great for me. <laughs> right. And then people were saying, I sent that to you. I can't believe you didn't get it. So I was trying to uh, go back and look at all the people who said they sent me emails to see if I got all of them. And I thought there were a couple I didn't get, but maybe I'm wrong. So I'm, I'm not going to totally cast a stone here and say that happened. Now this this is going to happen, right? I mean, th th we yeah. we've known this. This is this has been the nightmare scenario of of every cloud storage solution, which is, well, if I invest too heavily in this and I lose my connectivity, or if they lose connectivity, then I have no access to the data that I need to run my business. Uh, we've we've it's not quite so doom and gloom as it used yeah. to be. I think people have gotten no. used to it. Mm -hmm. uh, is that well, is know, that what we're looking at? The way that we access email has changed a lot. You know. Um, back in the in the days when like the on-prem stuff was running strong, I mean, a lot of people uh, had on-site Exchange servers and they were accessing Outlook through their Windows PC in the same building, perhaps, or on the same network, um, and that kind of thing made sense. But I mean, you know, today we access email on devices. Uh, we're on our phones. We're on tablets. You know, it, it's not the the notion that my company's lost its internet access is kind of a nebulous concept. I mean. Mm -hmm. um, my company could lose their internet access. It wouldn't impact me in the slightest. I'm not anywhere near my company um, and vice versa. You know, so I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm, I like running around like Chicken Little as much as anybody, but I, I, I still think distributed cloud services make a lot more sense from a reliability slash accessibility standpoint than I have a, an ex, you know, like a small business server in my closet and hopefully it's not 150 degrees in there. And you know, it's behind me. I mean, I don't, you know, I, I, I mean, I get the argument, but I, I, I think it's time to embrace the cloud. It is. <laughs> right, because yeah. You have to remember, yeah. it, uh, uh, you know, Mike Baz says on Twitter and he's right. It, people's internal servers go down too, right? Does your on-prem email never go down if you're in a big company? No, that right. goes down sometimes, yeah. right? I mean, well, anyway, as, an, as an enterprise person, the only thing different between this and the outage we would have at the office, it was, someone else fixes it. If it, right. if it was on premise, I had to go down there and figure out what was going I, and wrong. By the yeah. way, I consider that to be a benefit. Yeah, absolutely. You, know, you don't want to be the guy getting called on a weekend because your exchange server went down. It's like, hey, I know it's the 4th of July and everything, but get to fix yeah. the exchange server, you know? So, so sometimes your, your users blame you whether you're hosting on Microsoft or you're yep, the one maintaining yep. it. They don't know. They just know email's down. We don't know where our right. email is, but. So, so both of you would say that you, you'd still go with the cloud solution, right? I mean, even, oh, yeah. even with this outage, you'd say, I, I'm sure if you map it out over time, reliability is still better if you go with the cloud. It's still very safe to fly. Mary Jo? Uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm happy using Exchange Online. I haven't had a problem with it, really. I mean, this week was the first problem I've had in a really long time with it. You know who would agree with you? Who? L.A. County. That's right, Los Angeles. Now, uh, this this is a great story. This is th I actually I'm going to use this as my new case study. Anytime we talk about on-prem versus cloud, mm. they were in the process a three-year program of upgrading all of their individual mail services to Exchange. They were going to use on-premise Exchange because they wanted all the departments, the 32 departments, talking to each other. They had completed 12 of the 32, upgraded them to Exchange, done all the migration that they needed to do in order to get the data in. When someone said, wait a minute, you know, three years ago, cloud services were really immature, but now this Office 365 looks pretty decent. So they, they tried it. They halted the deployment. And for two of the departments, they, they let them try Office 365. And at the end of the trial, they decided they're going to scrap on-prem. They're actually going to remove the on-premise exchange servers that they had already installed. And everybody 
is switching over to Office 365. This is the entire county of Los Angeles. Now, the, the interesting thing about this story is that, well, they had the direct comparison. I mean, this wasn't, well, we think theoretically the cloud might be better. They were able to do side-by-side -side comparisons of the two services. And what they found was, one, the cloud was more uh, convenient. Two, because you could use it on mobile devices. Two, it was less expensive. And three, for that less expensive licensing cost, you didn't just get exchange mail, you got Office 365. Now, uh, I want to throw this to you first, Paul. Is is this, are these the kinds of experiences that are finally going to let these large municipalities, these government agencies, which have historically been one of the biggest buyers of enterprise-type services, will this finally convince them, okay, yeah, I guess we could trust this? Yeah, I mean, for some of them, I, I, I do think that for any traditional IT type infrastructure, it's going to be tip, it's going to be Microsoft based, and going to Office 365 if that's what you're going to do. Uh, if you're going to go to the cloud, I mean, uh, makes the most sense, right? It, rather than saying go to Google or go to some competing thing, even though you you do see that happen sometimes, um, um, which I think is a huge mistake. But yeah, I mean, I, Microsoft needs to get Office 365 to the point, and actually, as I'm saying it, I realize they already have where you know it can integrate with what you already have and and make those migrations easier because like the LA County thing if I understand it they were doing like a mass migration um that is a like a perilous undertaking um you know an easier if they had thought they were going to 365 to begin with I mean they could have done a migration office 365 in stages and they could have federated their environment with their on-prem stuff and and you know that it could have been a smoother transition perhaps than what they did um but yeah, I mean, I, this, look, it's going to happen. It's like the snowball, you know, I mean, there's always going to be those people that resist it, but it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually the people who are standing around, you know, screaming for their exchange 23, you know, 2003 servers running NT or whatever, um, you know, they're, they're not just the minority, they're kind of like the cranks, you know, and it's, it's not going to happen tomorrow or next year, but it, um, yeah, I mean, it has to happen. It has to. Of course, I say this as my uh, my trusty laptop here is running Office 2007. But <laughs> I know, it's a, that is embarrassing. <laughs> but Office 365 actually is quite nice. I mean, I, it, I, I got yeah. to play with it in my last uh, my last assignment. And um, uh, the, the one thing that I found that above all was the advantage that I grasped onto was the migration services. Migration is tedious, it is time-consuming, and it is fraught with danger both for your oh, data yeah. and your career because you do it wrong and that's it, you're dead. But Office 365 d did it without even blinking. That, that was the amazing thing to me. When, when that actually happened and was able to pull the user's data from, from disparate sources, I, I said, okay, yeah, this, this is what we're going to use. Anytime we do a deployment, this is it now. Mary Jo, is, is, this, is this it? Are, are we looking at the future? Is the future in the cloud? Is the cloud on an Azure server somewhere? Oh, well, that's an interesting point, too. And Paul just touched on that earlier. He said it was interesting when Exchange Online and and uh, Link Online went down, Azure didn't. And the reason is Microsoft's own Office 365 is not hosted on Azure, which is an interesting <laughs> thing to know. <laughs> I was kind of hoping you would pick up on that. <laughs> uh, yeah. So it, it runs in Microsoft data centers, Office 365 does. And they've said publicly multiple times that the ultimate plan is to put it on Azure, but right now it isn't on Azure. So um, that's that's kind of an interesting point. And do you really need to be on Azure or could you just have things um, connect you to Azure, like share the same billing service as Azure, same, uh, share the same directory service? That's where they are right now. Uh, so yeah, I, I think the cloud is the future though. I mean, Microsoft's putting all their eggs in the Azure and the Office 365 basket. Um, they, they're going to keep rolling out new servers on-prem. They've already said there's going to be a new version of Exchange, SharePoint, and Link coming to market next year that you can run on-prem. But we don't really know how, how much longer that continues into the future. We, but we do know that those things are not the focus and that they will not never be as feature complete as the versions in the cloud, nor will they appear on the same schedule, right? I mean, uh, it, it, there's been that switch. And so... The emphasis that they have on development is on the cloud because one of the one of the great benefits of Office 365 that I'm sure we've talked about recently is this notion that once you can ensure that everyone has Exchange plus SharePoint plus Link, 
that you can think of those things holistically rather than as individual servers. Whereas when you're developing for an on-prem version of Exchange Server, for example, you can only create new Exchange features. You can't, I mean, you'll create some things that interop with other Microsoft products, obviously, but you can't emphasize that stuff because there's no way to guarantee that all of your customers have that stuff or have the most recent versions of those products. And it gets into this kind of a hairy mess. Whereas in Office 365, you have that stuff. It's just there, it's, it's guaranteed. And it makes it a completely different uh, perspective from the part of Microsoft in, de in developing new versions going forward. Actually, let, let's talk a little bit about, about that future-proof uh, Azure. I, I do think that the, the future is in the cloud, and the future for Microsoft is definitely in Azure. They've been pushing it hard. Uh, we, we touched on this briefly, but Mary Jo, they ran out of, sometimes they say, so they ran out of <laughs> IPv4 addresses. They were actually stealing them from a Brazilian <laughs> geo geocache of IPv4 addresses in order to get their services back up, which meant that people visiting Yahoo at some point they started getting the, the Portuguese language sites for Yahoo because the IPs were in the wrong domain. Now, I, I got to ask you, with Microsoft being one of the entities that has been pushing on IPv6 so hard, they've, they, they've, been, they've been stressing that all of their products are dual stacked. You can run IPv6 across, aside IPv4. How is this happening? How is it that after this big push for Azure, they seem to be caught by surprise in not having enough IPv4 addresses. And the better question is, why are they still using IPv4 addresses? Padre, if I knew those answers, I think <laughs> I would not be a journalist. <laughs> I have no idea how that happened. And it was kind of surprising. I, I remember it was in a blog post. It was like, oh, by the way, guys, this happened. And um, whoops, uh, we were surprised. And... Right. They didn't really even try to explain why it happened or how how they were surprised, but it was just like, yeah, we, we're sorry for the inconvenience. We ran out. <laughs> that was kind of it. <laughs> the worst thing about that is they didn't say, yeah, we ran out, but we're, we're working to fix the problem. There is no yeah. fix for the problem. The IPv4 no no. addresses are gone. No. There are no, no it's, more. It's like when you have a 16th of a tank of gas and you're thinking, I can make it home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, I got this. Yeah. No, it's it's even better than that. It's like having a sixteenth of a tank of gas and making yeah. it home, and then saying, "I'm sure it's enough to drive to work." <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, I'll never need yeah. gas again. Let's not worry about this. Yeah. I'm, look, I'm looking at their blog post right now, and they said, um, "We are currently working with a few major IP geolocation database companies to update the location of the IPs, which should help alleviate this issue." Um, but that's pretty much all they had to say about it. Yeah, and which yeah. which doesn't help because no. with the big push for Azure. There's, they're going to have more customers, not fewer. And e every single one of those customers with, with as many services as they want to offer is going to need a new IPv4 address until Microsoft says, no, we're just switching over to 6. We're, we're, we're going to move to IPv6 and we're, we're going to say goodbye to IPv4. That is the only possible yeah. solution at the moment. Well, as, I mean, isn't everybody bound to this as well? I mean, it's not just Microsoft who's having this right. issue or is going to have this issue, right? I mean, the world the world is still IPv4 and people there, are moving right. to IPv6, right? There is a finite number of IPv4 IP addresses. And they're gone. Yeah. And they're gone. Which, yeah. by the way, I um, I own uh, 1,024 of them. So Microsoft, yeah, so you're actually you'd like part to make me an, an offer... <laughs> I, I, um, IPv4 is like the fossil fuel of the internet. Yeah, exactly. you know, it's, uh, it's a finite resource, but people it is a finite resource. It. Yeah, I, I'm I'm thinking a million dollars per address. That's you could if you make me that offer. <laughs> you won't see me next <laughs> let's week. Get, let's get rid of a couple of Apple blogs. We'll be all set. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Let's 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 move on. Uh, Paul, you've got a little something something about Microsoft and Canon <laughs> cross licensing. I'm I, I'm kind of thrilled. Uh, tell tell me tell no, me no. more. Actually, that's, that's Mary Jo's. Oh, Mary Jo, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Um, so today, Microsoft announced that they've, uh, lic they're have they engaged in a cross-licensing agreement with Canon. They won't say which patents, but they are saying they're in the mobility and the digital Im imaging space and, the, and that the two are cross-licensing each other's patents in that space. So this isn't one of those Android patent agreements like we've seen Microsoft forging with a lot of uh, ODMs and OEMs, but this is just about the two of them agreeing to share their patent portfolio in this area. And a lot of people are asking me, is 
Does that mean that Canon is getting rights to any of the Nokia patents that Microsoft acquired when they got the handset business from Nokia around uh, the camera stuff and imaging? And I would assume so, but Microsoft is not talking about the specifics on this, so I can't tell you exactly what they're exchanging here. But very interesting. Uh, it's especially interesting to me because a year ago, uh, Microsoft did a licensing agreement with Nikon, another camera vendor. But in that case, it was Microsoft having Nikon pay them because Nikon was using Android in their cameras. So this right. isn't that kind of an agreement. This is something very different, more more of an IP exchange kind of a thing. Yeah, in the, in the previous one, they were looking for payment. Here, they're, it looks like they're actually looking for tech. And yeah. I mean, if you think about Microsoft's imaging technology, you kind of have to go back to Connect and and Office and Xbox One, right? Because I mean, they're not going to build this into a, a Windows Phone. They're going to build this into one of their hardware products. Yeah, you, no? you'd think. You would think. I don't know. We yeah. don't really know which yeah, patents or what they're using. Yeah. I mean, it could be for the phones, right? It could be for things like Connect. It could be for other kinds of cameras they may have coming out. We don't really know it what it's for. for Skype. You know, it could be for um, Skype. telecommunications. Yeah, I mean, it could, yeah, there's all kinds of applications. Actually, that's right. I remember Canon actually has a fantastic portfolio of enterprise communication patents. So it could be that. It doesn't actually have to be imaging. Not bad, not bad. Now, speaking yeah. of uh, things that we, we want to know more about but don't really have as much information about, uh, Paul, <laughs> I was really excited by the pre-release site. I, I think there was a lot of people who were excited, but uh, we have to contain our excitement a little longer. Well, why is that? I'm sorry, you were excited about the what? The pre-release, Office pre-release. Oh, yeah. yeah, I just found out about this, and uh, too, too late, as it turns out. This would have been a great tip. Um, uh, the Office team, I, I don't know what to call them anymore, but the office group was looking for uh, pre-release testers. And uh, there was some speculation that one of the things they wanted people to test was Office for Android tablets, right? The uh, follow-up to Office for iPad. Um, they were opening this up to businesses and individuals with, you know, separate sign-up forms and everything. And I got really excited about it. But then when you clicked on the link, it was already shut down. <laughs> so um, it kind of came and went, you know, so... You know what I Maybe bet this be is back. for? I'll tell you what I bet this is for. Office mm -hmm. for Android. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that, right. Yeah, that's the... Yep. Yeah. Because that's the next thing they're going to do, uh, according to our sources. That Office for Android is going to be out before the end of this year. And that's the touch first, uh, very customized version of Office for Android. Not the one for phones, for, for tablets. So I bet yep. it's probably about the right time. And maybe even for Office 16, the next version of the desktop apps. Uh, but those two things Speaking are what's of next. Which, and not to mention Office for Mac, which, by the way, is yep. where? What, what's going on with, <laughs> you know, no Office, <laughs> the, the most ver recent version is still 2011? Yep. I mean, that's... Which they rolled out in 2010, mm, right? So that, yeah, that was really the last... behind, yeah. Well, Apple's All giving up support things. on their desktop. Why Why should Microsoft do it anymore? <laughs> <laughs> I don't they know. They make a you lot know, of Microsoft. money. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. they still... They, good, good point. Uh, you know, Apple has sold a lot of MacBooks. I mean, um, they 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 still, I believe, do not have that um, Sky Skyder OneDrive for business clients nope. running on the Mac, for example. You know, there's a lot of stuff that needs to come together over there. Speaking of coming together, Microsoft uh, buys game developer plug-in creator Syntax Tree. Uh, Mary Jo, what's what's that about? It's it's for Visual Studio, so it's a development platform. Mm -hmm. It is. So if you're if you're a Windows 8 or a Windows Phone 8 developer, you've probably heard that Microsoft's been doing a lot of work around the Unity gaming engine uh, and framework. So today they announced they bought a company called Syntax Tree. And what they make is a thing called the Unity VS plugin for Visual Studio. This is something a lot of people are really excited about because it shows that Microsoft's integrating even more deeply between uh, Visual Studio and, and the Unity framework. It also is interesting because uh, a lot of what Unity does is cross-platform game development. And people have been very interested if Microsoft is going to go more cross-platform with Visual Studio than it is already uh, with its agreement with Xamarin and the work it's doing around Mono. Some people have even said to me they wonder if Microsoft would port Visual Studio to other platforms. I don't know if they ever will, but... It's really interesting to see them do more and more cross-platform development work kind of around the edges 
uh, because Microsoft historically hasn't been a company focused on developing for non-Microsoft platforms. This is changing a lot. So they've, they've done uh, deals with Unity, with Havoc, Marmalade, Corona Labs. All these companies make gaming uh, tools and gaming frameworks for developers uh, on a variety of platforms, including Windows 8 and Windows Phone 8. Very interesting that they're doing this. Yeah, we used uh, Visual Studio for our first module of programming for our coding show here, Coding 101. And uh, it, it does work on Mac, and they, they're promising that they're going to work on a version that might work with Android slash Linux. But uh, it would be nice to see a little bit of cross-platform compatibility with, with that development. I, I, you know, it, it, there's not a lot of incentive for Microsoft to do it, but right. it, it would be easier for the developer if that whole develop once, compile multiple times wasn't just for different flavors of Windows. I would give anything for Microsoft to support Android and iOS development and Visual Studio with their languages and frameworks. That would be so excellent. Although they need to so change the name to something like Swifter. Or <laughs> Darty, <laughs> you know, Swifter, yeah. That nice edge. <laughs> <laughs> uh, folks, I think this is the time of the show where we have to start talking about the picks. Is is I mean, is that about right? I, I, yep. Sure. My first time running the back it, so. of the book. Back, back of the book. Of the right book. Yeah. I oh. added a, a couple of picks while we were doing the show, so you might not see them in the in the notes. But I've um, well hit us. I've been bulking it up. <laughs> so um, the tip of the week is kind of relegated to uh, a slightly small crowd. It's uh, primarily for Surface Pro 3 users, but um, actually for anyone who has a connected standby based Windows PC or device. Um, although my understanding is that most of those people are not having problems with sleep. But if you have a Surface Pro 3, you may have heard that there's some power management issues and Microsoft issued a firmware um, update, but depending on, you know, combinations of hardware devices you may have installed and so forth, you can still have some issues. And so um, there is a command line tool in Windows called Power Config. It's, you run it from the command line, like Power CFG. And it has all kinds of command line switches, as these applications always do. And new to Windows 8.1 is a switch. Uh, it's called Slash Sleep Study. And what it does is print out an HTML-based report of how well your um, computer sleeps. <laughs> it's like a, it's literally a, a sleep study. And I was joking when I did my, on my Surface Pro 3, I, it, it, it was saying basically that my Surface Pro 3 needs a CPAP because it's not sleeping correctly. Um, but you can find out what's causing the problem, um, or some of the things that are causing the problem. So, um, in particular, I would say on Surface Pro 3, we're in kind of a weird spot right now. The device just came out. It's kind of new. There's clearly something going on with networking. Um, I've got a, a bug reporting with Microsoft. They're investigating my, you know, like a, a, a memory dump from my machine and trying to figure out what's going on. But um, I had written before about issues with Hyper-V, but it seems that it extends beyond just whether or not you have Hyper-V. There's something, something with that wireless networking controller, something with that driver, something to do with wireless networking. Um, people are, are, are seeing various issues where the wireless network doesn't connect correctly. Um, where it comes back and it doesn't uh, connect at full speed or doesn't give you the throughput you're supposed to be getting. Um, and, and it's doing, you know, it's a, there's a tenuous connection between uh, an advanced power management um, capability like Connect Standby or what we're calling Instant Go now and this kind of hardware. And so uh, I would say if you, if you have a Surface Pro 3, this is something to keep an eye on. I like that. And, and actually, since Surface Pro 3 owners have been having issues with battery power, I, and I think at this point it may be psychological because you think that your Surface yeah, is, is having yeah. a weak battery. This might be the perfect tool for you because now you can actually see. Oh yeah, yeah, it, you can it, see. Mm, yeah, yeah. Anytime you can get it, that it, information. It could be a particular device to drive. You know, in the driver, it could be a particular application. Uh, it's actually very interesting. If you have a Windows Phone, um, there's a similar utility built into Windows Phone where it will kind of show you in the Power Saver uh, settings what applications are really hitting the battery. Uh, and it, it just gives you a, like kind of an eagle eye view of what's going on on the on the device. So, kind of a kind of a useful thing. Um, with regards to software picks, I actually have several. I don't know if you can all see all of them in the notes. I've they just a couple, exploded but, onto my screen. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my goodness! Yeah. Well, these things have just all happened, you know. So, um, I, I wrote a, an article early in the week about Bing Rewards. Um, there's a Bing Rewards app now for Windows Phone, and so. If you don't know what Bing Rewards is, it's basically like a frequent flyer program, but it's for, you know, Bing search. 
um, you earn rewards that you can then cash in for things. And those things could be Amazon gift cards. It could be, you know, Xbox Live Gold uh, months or whatever, all kinds of stuff. Um, and you earn those rewards by obviously searching with Bing, but also doing other things. They have daily goals and daily things you can do and so forth. Um, Bing is part of your phone. It's super easy to use in your phone. It's kind of automatic. And so uh, this app gives you a way to keep track of, A, what's going on today, where your points are. It lets you redeem those points for uh, rewards and so forth. And so, I, you know, I, I think for people who are using Windows and are kind of involved in this ecosystem, uh, just signing up for Bing Rewards is like super simple. It's it's a no-brainer. It doesn't cost you anything. It's automatic and you, could, you, know, you can earn rewards. So uh, if you use Windows Phone, uh, get the app as well and get that going. Apollo, let me ask you a question. Uh, mm -hmm. How many Bing points do I need to actually get something worthwhile? Because, I mean, yeah. Alex, if you take a look uh, at my screen, uh, these have been accumulating for years. I have 3,736. Oh, you can get all kinds of good stuff. So what you should do is go to the Bing Rewards website, which is probably bing.com rewards, I guess. Let me see. Uh, yeah, that would probably do it. Bing.com slash rewards. And Can I get anything good? Yeah, yeah, you can, actually. <laughs> So go to redeem Ooh. at the top. Oh, I like this. <laughs> yeah, click on it. You have a lot of, you have, you, I have, you have many more points than I do. Well, they, so I mean, they're, I'm just see... stacking them up. Oh yeah. my gosh, I could get like $3 Amazon gift cards. Yeah, yeah, but you could get a bunch of them. I could get like <laughs> you 20 know? of them. Yeah, 100. Oh, I could get 100 of them. Ooh, actually, well, I could point... pay for my <clears throat> Xbox Live. Yeah. Right. And so you've been kind of browsing with Bing and you were going to be doing that anyway. And now you're getting rewarded for it. So why not do this? I, I am. I, I will say that that's not a joke. I, I use Bing more than I use Google. Bing is my primary search engine. Padre. Yeah. So, yeah. right. So I've got more. Take advantage of it. Oh, how wait, many do you have? He's got 3,700. Wait, 3,000. That's really close. It's close, but how many more. do I have? 3,772. Are you kidding me? You guys are that close. Wait, have you redeemed at all? I, I <laughs> redeem a few things here and there. But. Oh, no, he's like 30 points ahead of me. Well, yeah, I could fix that right now. Hold on. I'm going to spend the rest of the show just clicking yeah, just, on things. Yeah, just search for 30 things. <laughs> right. All right, so that's that's uh, for the Bing users that's out one. there. Make sure to get that app and so that you can add up your rewards on your mobile device as well as on your desktop. <laughs> and then you, too, can get $3 Amazon gift cards. Yes, Yes, you can. It's not just that, though. You've got you've got a whole section of, of software picks. Bring us through. Yes, I've got more. So if you have Windows Phone 8.1, uh, that means you either have a 630, 635, or you use the developer preview program to upgrade early. And they, you know that one of the big differences with this release is that since the phone is RTM, they've been updating a lot of the, you know, the integrated apps. And, you know, Calendar app was up, uh, updated this week twice, actually, because they screwed it up the first time. Um, but Skype is now an integrated part of Windows Phone 8.1. And so they updated the Skype app this week. Um, it's US only, uh, and you can obviously change your region, but uh, you can now make Skype calls with Cortana if you have Windows Phone 8.1. So Cortana being the new search feature that's in that version of the OS. And uh, basically, it, it's exactly what it sounds like. You know, Skype, call somebody, Skype, call this person, uh, that kind of thing. And you can do audio calls, uh, video calls, and all that kind of stuff through voice command, which, you know, is obviously kind of a cool thing. And you'll get this automatically. So uh, Skype and Calendar are just built into the system. If you're on Windows 8.1, these apps now get upgraded um, in the background automatically. You don't have to okay them. You don't have to go get them. They, it just happens. So if you have that, you probably have already gotten this. Um, and then while we were doing the show, Microsoft released the sorry, the release candidate version of Update 3 for Visual Studio 2013. Um, I'm, I'm, I have not uh, installed any of these Update 3 pre-release versions, so I'm on Visual Studio 2013 Update 2. Uh, this is a cool video on Channel 9 featuring my buddy Dimitri Lyalen. Did you ever meet Dimitri, Mary Jo? Yeah, I have met him. Were, yeah. Yeah. yeah, he was from New York. He's since moved to Redmond, and now he... Uh, he's, he works for Microsoft, but now he's working for them out of the home office. So now he gets to make videos, apparently. Um, but he's a big uh, Windows phone slash Windows developer guy. In fact, he developed one of our Twit apps, did he not? Mm -hmm. Yep. I never get to meet those cool people because I never yeah. get to go yeah, to those events. Sad. And then, I, <laughs> you may not know this, but Leo and Mary Jo know that I have a, an infamous history of mispronouncing things. So I'm going to assume that I will be mispronouncing <laughs> the name of this one. Um but there is a service called, I want to say, Scribd. Yeah. 
There. No, that no, works. Okay. Yeah. Normally, I would say Scrib D, um, which is essentially an online service for books. And it's, it kind of bills itself as the biggest uh, collection of something. I don't know. <laughs> I <like> books. <laughs> I don't know how to use it. It's... Uh, it's something big, and it's an online service. Anyway, they they have had a mobile app on iOS and Android for quite some time, and today they released one for Windows. Look at them go. So if you're using the Windows platform, which you should be, you can now access the service. I guess they have like a subscription service. You pay 8 or $9 a month, and you get complete access to their collection while you're a paying subscriber. So it's kind of like one of the, like a music subscription service, except for... Except for books. It's, a, it's actually really good. I mean, if, if you it's are called Scrib, not Scrib D, right? It, no, it's I've been calling it Scribd. Scribd. I've heard Scribd, Scribd. Scribd D, but I think they're wrong. So, <laughs> Scribd. Okay. <laughs> Scribd. My natural inclination would be to call it something ridiculous, but I assume it's Scribd. Uh, see, here we go. Web9497 uh, says it's Scribd. Scribd. Awesome. There you go. Of course it is. Scribd. That makes way more sense. I knew I, see, I knew I could screw that up. <laughs> I'd, uh, I'd, I'd give up. I'd, I, I'm, still, Scribd, I'm still stuck Scribd on the GIF and JIF. So, I yeah. mean, I ain't going anywhere beyond that. Yep. Okay. Mary Jo Foley, Enterprise Pick of the Week. So this this may seem like Chicken Little, the Sky is Falling kind of a pick, but one year from this month, July 14th, 2015, Windows Server 2003 is coming to end of life in terms of support. Oh, dun, dun, dun. <laughs> and you know what? It's I'm telling you guys this an, a year in advance because... It's a big difference between updating a client and updating a server. And there are a lot of small businesses, especially, that still run on Windows Server 2003. So when this happens, when July 14th, 2015 happens, what, what this means is you get no more updates from Microsoft, including security updates. It's just like XP. No more security updates. You're going to be out of compliance if that matters to your organization. And uh, lots of bad things could potentially happen to you. So Microsoft and a lot of their partners are are really making a push right now for people to migrate, get the migration going, at least get it started planning wise. Um, there are a lot of different tools. There's a lot of partners who have services that you can avail yourself of. And Microsoft's pitch, of course, is you should go to the cloud. Just just go, go cold turkey, go to the cloud. But if you're not going to go to the cloud, at least go to Windows Server 2012 or 2, which is the most recent version of Windows Server. So this is just your early warning service, courtesy of your enterprise. <laughs> nice. It's like when I get a storm warning on my phone. But, but Mary yeah. Jo Foley, <laughs> can, can I just do what people have been telling me to do with my Windows XP stations? Just unplug it from the network and everything's fine, right? Yeah, uh, no. <laughs> yep, uh, no. <laughs> Although I, I wonder what Steve Gibson would have to say, because I know he right. was somebody saying, yeah, you know, there's ways around this end of life kind of thing. The, the point yeah. you make about upgrading servers is particularly astute now because when you think about going from 2003 yeah. to anything, right? We've yeah. had 20, <laughs> we've had 2008, 2008 R2, 2012, right. 2012 R2, and by, right. the possibly architecture by next year. The architecture is hugely Hugely different. Um, everything is different pretty much between that release. Yeah. I, I'm a big proponent of upgrading. I mean, I was using uh, my chin in the upper third of the... No, I was I was using Office 2003. I did just upgrade to Office 2007. So um, I, I think I can... That's, a, that's incredible. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean that in the literal sense of the word. <laughs> uh, we've got a rumor of the week. We do. And it's actually almost not even a rumor. It's I, I would put this almost in the fact category, though it hasn't been announced yet. But it's very interesting. So the rom the guy whose name is the Romit on Twitter, who's a really good yes. enterprise guy, who we Paul and I talk to a lot on Twitter. He tipped me off the other day that the founder of Couchbase, which is a NoSQL database, is joining Microsoft, which is very Ooh. interesting. And what he's going to do is become the general manager of business intelligence services at Microsoft. His name is James Phillips. He's the co-founder of Couchbase. And this has a lot of really in interesting implications for Microsoft because, you know, no SQL is not SQL. And Microsoft's whole, whole past to this point has been around SQL Server. So very interesting they would take somebody who uh, is the founder of a no SQL database company and put him in a pretty high level, pretty responsible position on the business intelligence team intelligence team at Microsoft. I'm not sure when they're going to announce this, maybe at the partner conference in DC, maybe before that. Uh, but the the um, tip comes from 
the blog of Jen Underwood, who runs, uh, she's the founder and principal consultant of Impact Analytics. I don't know how she found this out, but I went on James Phillips' Twitter profile and his LinkedIn profile, and I see, yes, it looks as though he has already joined Microsoft. Wow. Well, yeah. Everyone's joining Microsoft these days. It's the end thing. I guess so. <laughs> now, the part of the show that I was most looking forward to, the beer Actually, pick. Actually, um, you know, I'm, Wait, sorry. I'm sorry. Before we do the fun, the fun bit. Okay. Um, I do have, I guess I'll call it a tip, and I'm embarrassed to say I Somebody recommended this to me on actually to Mary Jo and I. So maybe you'll remember this. Uh, and maybe it was email, not Twitter. And maybe I should just keep babbling for a few minutes. Anyway, um, <laughs> Rob, Rob Canyon, who was one of the co founder the three co-founders of Compaq, has written a book called Open, How Compaq Ended IBM's PC Domination and Helped Invent Modern Computing. And, you know, being in the PC industry for a long time, I thought I kind of understood the Compaq story and why they were relevant and you know, what they contributed and everything. And if you were to ask me, you know, say a week ago, what was the deal with Compaq? I would have said, well, they reverse engineered the IBM PC BIOS in a clean room and created the PC industry, essentially the PC compatible industry. Um, this book mentions that almost in passing, but there's actually a lot more that happened at, at Compaq. And one of the revelations in this book, which the, um, the author and, and, and uh, co-founder of the company says is uh, new information and in that this has never been publicized, is that Microsoft used to make these custom versions of DOS for different companies. And um, they were all slightly incompatible with each other. It was one of the big problems with early PCs. And so they, they basically fixed it so that it would always be compatible with IBM's versions of, version of DOS. And because this was so valuable, they actually licensed it back to Microsoft. Like Compaq actually licensed their version of MS-DOS to Microsoft so that Microsoft could then license it. And the, the version of MS-DOS that we kind of all know and love that we all use, that the retail version and everything was based on that because it was the one that was compatible with everything. What's this book it's called? Cool, it's called Open. Okay. And the, it's just, it sounds kind of weird. There's a lot, if, you, if you search for Open on, say, Audible or Amazon, you're going to find a lot of books. But it's written by Rob Canyon. It's available in audio format, uh, audible format as well as Kindle format. I actually switched between the two. Uh, it's a very short book. It's not, it's not going to take you weeks to get through or anything. But if you're interested in the early history of the PC industry, you just like this kind of stuff. Um, there's some, it's, it's absolutely worth reading. And I, I sort of read it not thinking I was going to learn anything, and I was pleasantly surprised. Open, that's uh, soon to be a movie made by <laughs> uh, Michael Bay. <laughs> <laughs> right. Things will explode. Hopefully, they can get uh, the same people from that Steve Jobs movie to play Bill That's Gates right. and <laughs> all the major player, you know, Steve Ballmer. And Actually, it would be great if they could get Aston Kutcher, Kutcher to just play every Silicon Valley CEO. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, just keep right, making those right, movies right. and use the same cast over and over again. Yeah. There we go. Open. Yes. Well, I think I have my next Audible book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a quick, it's a quick listen. So it's, it's, it's worth grabbing. All right, Paul. Now, now, can we can we talk about beer? Yes, yeah, sorry. As, as, as I said, I don't drink <laughs> beer, but I love watching people drink. <laughs> wow, I am the complete opposite. But go on. Really? Okay. Mary Jo Foley, take us through. I will. Um, my beer pick of the week is something I also may mispronounce. Although I'll tell you, this is how I always pronounce it. It's a gozer, spelled G-O-S-E. I call it a gozer. Um, I've heard gozer. some people call it goes. Uh, what it is, is a salty and kind of a funky beer style. And the one I've had recently is from a brewery in Chicago called Off Color Brewing. The name of the beer is Troublesome. And the label's cool because it it mm. arranges the characters as tra -ble, which is blay is French for wheat, which is interesting, okay. some. And uh, it's really good. It, it has a little bit of coriander. It has a little bit of salt. It just is a really nice, refreshing, light 4.5% beer. Perfect for the hot, humid summer day we are having here in New York today. <laughs> yes, and I, I love like this beer style. Uh, it's one of my favorite styles. It's very unusual. If you've never had it, you first taste it and you're like, wow, sour and salty, kind of odd. But it really works. And it's a very refreshing, good choice. So if you ever have a chance... To try a gozer, give it a tr give it a try. It's good. Is, where is it, where is is it this gozer? From, where, is it, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was. Just, where is it from? As I was, I it's, was uh, off, 
off color brewing which is in um chicago and in chicago. it's in bottles here i've seen it at whole foods and a few other places so it's around yeah. Isn't Gozier a, a really character cool. from Ghostbusters? That's like the evil god, right? <laughs> I, 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 can't, I can't think of Gozer without thinking, oh, and the Marshmallow Man too, right? <laughs> I'm sure in the chat room they'll tell us, are we pronouncing this correctly? Beer? Yeah, beer? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. That's the beer. Right? It's scribed, you idiots. <laughs> it's, it's Gozer uses scribed. <laughs> Everything comes around in circles. It's... Uh, now, I, I know that you uh, you already had a uh, a book pick and open, but do uh, you, you have anything else for us, Paul? I do have some other Audible picks, but I can hold on to those for for next week. I mean, I, this I, I think that's more of a relevant choice for everybody. You know, yeah. I, I will say I, I I will offer the audiobook that I've been listening to mm -hmm. continuously. I, I heard it a month ago, and I I, I think I'm on my twelfth go around. It's called the Mar the Martian. Uh, by uh, Mr. Weir, it's uh, it's actually better in the Audible version than it is in the written version. I have the written version on my Kindle, and that's okay, right. but the audio version is fantastic. If you are a nerd about space, if you've ever enjoyed stories that aren't as much science fiction as they are science fact, you're, you're going to love The Martian. It's, it's all about a, an astronaut who gets left on Mars. There's, there's a freak accident, and he has to survive the next year and a half before he could potentially be rescued. It's, I mean, if, if you've ever liked like the triumph of the will or triumph of intelligence type stories, you're going to love it. It's called The Martian by, uh, I, I can't forget his first name. It's Andy, Mark, Andy, Weir. Andy Weir. Andy Weir. That's right. I think uh, Leo's actually listened to that before. He's probably, he's probably talked about it. It's, it's a fantastic book. That one looks really good. Yeah. So, uh, you know, folks, I think the, we've, we've pretty much run out our welcome here. We've got the, uh, this week in Google folks assembling behind me. I think they want to kick us out. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Any closing wisdom from uh, from from the two of you? Things that people should know about Windows that we haven't told them in the last two hours. Um, no, but wow. we should probably remind people that uh, Paul and I are both going to be at the Worldwide Partner Conference in Washington D.C. the week of July thirteenth, and we're talking yep. about having an informal beer tweet up probably on Tuesday. So watch. By Twitter. which we mean a blowout beer fest. At <laughs> <laughs> Wait, you're going to be in D.C. Yeah, we're both going to be in D.C. And we're also probably going to tape Windows Weekly live from the conference. Right. So more on that later. Wait, when um, is this? When is this? Next week? July next 13th. Week, the week after. The week of July 13th. You know, I was thinking about going back to D.C. July 13th. We could have a big meetup at the uh, Jesuit Residence, which does, by the way, have a decent connection and a lot of beer. Nice. If, do, they have a, do they have access to Trappist beers? Yes, we do. <laughs> then we could probably make that happen <laughs> let's make this happen well folks that concludes another wonderful episode of windows weekly paul therott is the superstar at the super site for windows at winsupersite.com you can pick up one of his books chalked full of all the tips and tricks you need for windows at the uh windows 81 book.com which includes paul your uh, your windows 8.1 field guide but you've got a service book is that out yet no, I'm still working on that, and I'm working on a Windows Phone 8.1 book as well. Uh, if you've ever wanted to learn how to trick out or tip out your devices, drop by Windows81book.com. Mary Jo Foley is the uh, mastermind behind All About Microsoft.com, a ZDNet blog, and can be found wherever discerning blog readers go for their news about Microsoft. You'll find them both here each week at twit.tv on Wednesdays, 11 o'clock Pacific. 2 o'clock Eastern, I believe it's 1800 UTC. And if you're free, you could always join us live at live.twit.tv. And as long as you're going to do that, why not jump into our chat room? You'll see us referencing them every, every once in a while at irc.twit.tv. And Padre, before we go, I just want to show this one more time. This two uh, hey, hey, 2007 is a good vintage. It's so <laughs> blue. It is odd. Look at this. Look, seriously, it's just awesome. It's awesome. Why would you want to switch away so from blue. that? so blue. I think it works just like Notepad. Looks good. Exactly. That's, that's what I like. There's no surprises. Why is also, there a, like a bar at the top? What is that? This? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, hey, thing? hey, just be lucky I didn't bring back Clippy. <laughs> Clippy was ready to... This thing's... Uh, yeah, actually. You got a button up there. I know. That's so weird, right? Hey, yeah, look yeah, at, right. Look, uh, people look at this and they say, oh, that's so backwards. No, I think it's it's retro. And retro is cool, folks. <laughs> I think a retro does mean backwards, but that's okay. You just don't. You just don't know. You, you, all of you, you just don't know. 
<laughs> now, if you if you do not have the ability to watch us live, you can also find us wherever discerning podcasts are aggregated. Uh, go ahead and jump on to Stitcher, iTunes, any other number of uh, podcast sources. Or you can find us here at our page, twit.tv slash WW. That's Windows Weekly. Or you can find all the different versions, audio versions, high definition versions. The, the version that you want for your device of choice. Until next time, Leo Laporte will be here next week. But I'm Father Robert Ballas here, the Digital Jesuit. See you next time on Windows Weekly. I just I have to say this, Jeffrey. I just I have to say that we just recently got an email from a fan who thanks us for having the Zoom subscription drop down in all of our See? show menus. See? And it wasn't me, apparently. No, no this is like right. last week. <laughs> My Zoom is currently in um, the Alto Plano of Bolivia. I was on the infamous road of death, and it flew out the window. Yikes. <laughs> and Whoa. fell 1,500 feet. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you could potentially be getting it back.